and introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, Dr. Timothy Erickson uh, has been, uh, he's working on his surgery residency here at North Star Vets. He earned his veterinary degree from Virginia Tech and completed internships in Chattanooga, Tennessee and Los Angeles, California. Uh, he came to North Star Vets and started working as an emergency doctor uh, before starting his residency. And so um, we were just catching up before uh, we let everyone in and um, he has been uh, doing a lot in the world of surgery uh, lately, as you can imagine. And so, um, so I'm really excited for this presentation tonight and, uh, and what uh, he's been, uh, what he's learned and ready to pass on to us. So Dr. Erickson, thank you, sir. All right, thanks all. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen. So uh, again, I'm Dr. Tim Erickson, uh, surgery resident here at North Star. And tonight um, we're gonna go over surgical management of the acute abdomen. We'll go over three different um, situations. So the overview for tonight, again, some case examples. After each example, we'll go over historical findings, exam, diagnostics, pathophys, surgical management, complications, prognosis, and then outcomes. So our first case is Thor, he's a six-year-old uh, malnutrited Great Dane. He presents for acute restlessness, non-productive vomiting, retching, and a distended abdomen. Um, on his exam, his temperature is 102.4, his heart rate's 160, he's panting, hypersalivating, retching in the room. He's got some abdominal distension with tympany. So our first set of diagnostics is going to be to take an abdominal x-ray. This here is a right lateral view. And what we're seeing here is called by a couple of different things um, from what I've heard. Smurf's at Popeye's arm, a reverse C or the double bubble, regardless of what it's called. This is going to be diagnostic for a gastric dilatation and volvulus or GDV. The other diagnostics we ran for Thor, CBC, hematocrit was increased at 52%. He's a stress leukogram, elevated ALT. His lactate's a bit elevated at 7.4 and normal is gonna be less than 2.5. And his ECG is showing intermittent runs of VPCs or ventricular premature complexes. So his diagnosis, gastric dilatation and volvulus with elevated lactate and intermittent VPCs. So the recommendation is gonna be emergency stabilization and surgery. In cases of GVV, we'll see various signalments, get different histories and uh, physical exam findings. So our typical signalment, we're gonna see you know, typically large breed dogs, deep chested dogs, a couple pictures on here, standard poodles, Irish wolfhounds, uh, Great Danes as well. We'll see those most commonly, but we also don't wanna forget our smaller deep chested guys such as basset hounds and dachshunds who can also have this happen. Client history, clients will report signs such as abdominal distension, the dog's going out, having non-productive vomiting, retching, drooling, and just restless and anxious. On exam, we'll find various degrees of shock, compensated versus decompensated. You may notice some abdominal distension with tympany. So as you flick it, it sounds like a kickball is kind of how I describe it. You may notice some splenomegaly as well. Diagnostics we have. In these cases, radiographs, again, we talked about it in the clinical example. We're looking for this double bubble, reverse C, uh, Smurf's hat um, to get us uh, on the right track. Lab work, we can see various uh, different abnormalities, hemoconcentration, stress leukogram. We may or may not see some degree of thrombocytopenia. They can have an elevated ALT, uh, potentially some prerenal azotemia. And then lactate is also gonna be something that's pretty important to look at. So again, our normal lactate is gonna be less than 2.5 millimoles per liter. We use this commonly to evaluate perfusion and then monitor our resuscitation efforts. For GDV, this is also predictive for survival. And there's a couple different uh, ways to look at this. There are some studies that look at strict cutoff values 
on the, I found three different studies range from six to nine millimoles per liter. The other way of looking at it is trending the uh, lactate. Personally, I find trending to be more helpful and more predictive because if we have an extremely high lactate, say in this case, 7.4, and after surgery, we're down to you know, three or you know, below um, 2.5 in normal range, we're gonna have a good outcome. So pathophysiology of GDV, a lot of this, you know, we've probably seen multiple times, but the stomach's gonna distend and rotate. So the pylorus and the proximal duodenum are first gonna move ventrally and then cranially moving from the right to the left. And then this distension of the abdomen can cause compression of the vena cava. This is gonna to lead to a decreased venous return, uh, hypotension, potentially a cardiogenic shock. And then as the stomach gets larger and larger, it can push up on the diaphragm and that's gonna to lead to some Im impaired breathing. When we were talking about the volvulus portion of this, we can see the twist be anywhere from 90 to 360 degrees. The most common is gonna be 180 degrees. In addition to the twist or portion of GDV, we'll see a couple other effects. Cardiac, where we can see something called myocardial depressant factor um, along with poor blood flow. This is gonna to lead to arrhythmias and those are gonna occur in about 40 to 70% of dogs. Gastric wall necrosis. This can happen as the stomach gets more and more distended. It's gonna cause an increase in intragastric pressures and this is gonna compromise the blood flow to the stomach. We also have our short gastric arteries cause supplying blood to, that, to the portion of the stomach. This can contribute, but isn't likely a primary cause um, for gastric wall necrosis. Um, in addition to um, the gastric wall necrosis, we can see thrombosis and necrosis of the spleen and then reperfusion injury. This is gonna be due to the untwisting of the stomach and releasing of reactive oxygen species. This is gonna cause oxidative injury. Risk factors, these are definitely important to know. They're definitely helpful in making recommendations for prophylactic gastropexies um, in our at-risk breed. So here we have the more common risk factors, large and giant breed dogs, they, a dog that's had a first degree relative that's had GDV, a dog that eats one large meal per day and just chows down and is eating very quickly. If they have exercise after a meal or they have a stressful event after a meal, this can be a risk factor. Splenectomy, there's conflicting reports some say it is a risk factor, some say it isn't really a risk factor. Given that it could be, if we're doing a splenectomy, the patient's otherwise stable, we'll go ahead and do the gastropexy um, to prevent a GDV in the future. Um, and lastly, the presence of a gastric foreign body um, can be a risk factor. All right, onto our treatment. Stabilization, this is commonly done at our referring hospitals um, or in the emergency room. We want to place two large bore IV catheters in the forelimbs. We want to avoid the hind limbs just because our venous return is not going to be very great because of the compression uh, of the vena cava by the stomach. We want to start fluid therapy. We'll typically use uh, crystalloids, uh, things like lactate ringers, plasmolite, normar. Start antibiotics. Routinely, we'll use something like cefazolin or ampicillin, antiemetics like Serenia and Zofran. Opioids, we want to use these for pain. We want to use full mu agonists, so something like methadone, fentanyl, or hydromorphone. Lidocaine, we tend to use in GDV cases. Lidocaine is more so for treating and preventing uh, arrhythmias. And first, we start with a bolus at two, one to two milligrams per kilogram body weight, and then we follow that up with a CRI at 50 to 75 microgram per kg per minute. And then the last step in stabilization is going to be decompression. So we'll go into our options here. We have our orogastric intubation. This is going to be used in our more severely affected patients, uh, recumbent, this is gonna offer a more rapid decompression. 
And then when we're using this technique, we're measuring from the nose to the last rib um, where the stomach's going to sit. If we're not doing the orogastric tube, we can do trochorization. In this situation, we'll use this when we can't use an orogastric tube. And when we do trochorize, we want to use a large bore catheter, something in the area of 14 to 18 gauge needle. We want to find the area of greatest tympany, uh, clip it, prep it, and then trochorize the stomach. With um, GDV, we want to also be cognizant of the spleen and make sure we're not putting a large bore catheter into the spleen. But once you get into the stomach, you'll know, you'll hear air rushing out of the catheter. You also likely will smell um, you know, something foul from the stomach contents. So our goals for surgery, we want to reposition the stomach, remove any devitalized and necrotic tissue, and then perform a gastropexy. In surgery, when we first open the stomach, we're going to see something like this top right picture. The omentum is going to be draped over the body of the stomach. We'll see the pylorus and the duodenum on the left side of the body. And then if we're feeling the um, gastroesophageal junction, we may feel some twists. And that, again, will give us our tip off that we're um, definitely tours. Intraop decompression. Usually the stomach's so distended, it's hard to see or do anything. Um, so for intraoperative decompression, I'll either pass an orogastric tube if I wasn't able to get it preoperatively, or I attach a 22 gauge needle to suction, uh, go into the stomach and suck all the air out, um, which gives me a little more room to correct the mouth position, which is our next step. So in correcting the um, mouth position, the uh, Pylorus is going to be on the left side of the body. So what I'll typically do is with one hand, I'll grab the pylorus. And then with my other hand, I'll use the back of the hand and push the body away from me as I'm pulling the pylorus towards me. And I have pretty good success with that. Again, we're going to see most commonly 180 degree uh, volvulus. If you're not sure, you can go again, feel the gastroesophageal uh, junction. And then if we still have a twist, we know that there is likely a greater than 180 degree volvulus. After we've got everything in its proper position, the next thing we want to do is an abdominal explore. And we're in these cases, we really want to focus on the stomach and the spleen. So for the stomach, the picture in the bottom right here is going to be evidence of gastric wall necrosis. This is going to occur most commonly at the greater curvature in the area of the body in the fundus of the stomach. When we're looking and assessing for viability, we want to look at wall thickness, cirrhosal surface color, the presence or absence of peristaltic waves, and bleeding if we incise into it. If there's any question or we have something that's obvious, like in this picture, we're looking, we're seeing something that it has thin walls, gray to green color doesn't bleed if we cut into it, and these are going to warrant a partial gastrectomy, um, or the stomach can be invaginated on itself. And then with the spleen, we're going to assess the spleen for color and blood flow, um, looking for evidence of, again, thrombosis, areas of necrosis. If we see any of those, you know, splenectomy is going to be uh, warranted in those cases. And then our next step is going to be to perform a gastropexy. There's a number of different ways of performing a gastropexy on this slide. Uh, on the far left here, uh, we have an incisional gastropexy. This middle slide, this middle picture here is a what's called a belt loop gastropexy. Top right picture is going to be a circumcostal gastropexy, and the bottom right here is a laparoscopic view of, of a laparoscopic gastropexy. The lapexies are going to be prophylactic. It's not something we're going to do in an emergent situation. For me personally, I tend to stick with the incisional gastropexy. I find it to be the simplest and I have good success with it. So this is the incisional gastropexy and how it's performed. So we, I would make an incision that's, a, uh, that's approximately four centimeters and through the neuromuscular layer of the stomach. 
and make a similar incision into the body wall here. And then I run two lines of suture, one deep. Um, I tend to use a 2-0 PDS in a simple continuous pattern um, to close my deep uh, layer of that. And then on the bottom left picture here, we're seeing the superficial layer being closed. So again, uh, another line of simple continuous 2-0 PDS. And the bottom right here is our finished product. So that's a completed incisional gastropexy. Post-op treatments for GDB patient. We're going to continue therapy, pain management, lidocaine CRI if we're having any intraoperative or preoperative uh, arrhythmias, antiemetics, and then we want to monitor um, these guys. Again, we're potentially trending lactate if we have you know, excessive bleeding from rupture of the short gastrics, we want to check a PCB. So our prognosis is generally very good um, with a 90% survival rate um, for the uh, really any gastropexy. So our prognostic indicators, our negative prognostic indicators are gonna be clinical signs greater than six hours in duration, uh, presence of hypotension, gastric necrosis, if we have a preoperative arrhythmia, peritonitis, um, or sepsis. Positive uh, prognostic indicators are going to include uh, pre-op lactate of less than six, and those we'll typically see a 99% survival rate in those cases with a lactate of less than six. And then if we have improving serial lactates as we're monitoring. The recurrence rate is pretty minimal to absent with uh, our belt loop and incisional gastropexies. The recurrence rate has been reported as zero. With circumcostal, we see about a three to six percent uh, recurrence rate. And then complications, you know, to talk to the owners about, we can see incisional infections, ileus, vomiting. We can see outflow obstructions, especially if the stomach's not positioned properly um, when we perform the gastropexy. And then we can see fatal arrhythmias uh, postoperatively. All right, on to our next case. So this is Hunter. He's a 15-month-old male neutered lab. He came in, he ate a sock four days ago. The owner said he usually passes them. Um, but for the past two days, he's had continuous nonstop vomiting, not eating, and he has some belly pain per the owner. On his exam, his temp's 100.3, his pulse is 140, he's panting, his gums are tacky, he's about 8% dehydrated, and he's painful on abdominal palpation. And when palpating, we can feel a tubular structure. All right, so our diagnostic, starting of our diagnostic plan, CBC. On his CBC, we're seeing some hemoconcentration of, with a hematocrit of 55%. He has a stress leukogram. His chemistry, he's mildly azotemic um, with a BUN of 40, a creatinine of 2.1. And on abdominal x-rays, what we're seeing here, I'll point them out as we go. Um, his stomach has a mild amount of gas, so we can see that here. And in the upper right portion of his stomach, we can see gas in his um, proximal descending duodenum. And then on the lateral here, um, we can see a, a curvilinear curvil linear uh, segment of bowel um, in the mid-abdomen. Uh, which has a fabric, uh, intraluminal fabric material. So his diagnosis, small intestinal obstruction, recommendation again, emergency stabilization and surgery. In our GI foreign body cases, signalman, we can really see any cat or dog breed or age. Um, a few common offenders, uh, consistent offenders are going to be our labs. Um, who are young and like to get into trouble. Um, and then our client history, they're, you know, commonly we're going to have owners reporting vomiting, anorexia, um, histories of dietary indiscretion or previous surgeries. And on exam, we may find um, abdominal pain. Sometimes you can palpate distended bowel loops or an obvious uh, foreign object of some kind in the abdomen, 
in cases of linear foreign bodies, we'll see bunching of the small intestines. Um, and we can also see string either protruding from the anus or looped around the tongue on oral exam. For diagnostics, uh, lab work, CBCs, we're typically gonna see female concentration. Uh, depending what we have going on, we may see a very high or very low white blood cell count. Uh, dehydration on chemistries, we may see azotemia. If we're concerned or we suspect sepsis, we may see hypoglycemia, and there may also be evidence of hypoalbuminemia. Um, the other two diagnostics we have would be imaging and fluid analysis, which we'll get into in the next couple slides. So abdominal radiographs, we have our discrete versus linear uh, foreign bodies. With our discrete, we're going to want to focus on always doing a, at least a two-view abdomen, but focusing on the left lateral. And this is going to help assess for a gastric foreign body. Um, also on x-rays, if we're seeing pneumoperitoneum or gas in the, stuff, in the abdomen, we, we're going to start suspecting uh, perforation um, somewhere in the uh, GI tract. With discrete uh, foreign bodies, we'll also see you know, two populations of bowels, which, uh, which are typically described. And that's going to be multiple loops of gas dilated small intestine of different uh, diameters. And actually, in up to 30% of obstructed dogs, they'll have no radiographic signs at all. Shifting over to the linear foreign bodies, again, a left lateral is helpful. We're assessing for a gastric component. Uh, which we can see uh, the pylorus as, uh, as an anchor point um, for a linear foreign body. And then looking at the bowel, we're looking for uh, plication, so comma-shaped gas pockets, and stacking of bowel loops, which in uh, this image we can see you know, stacking and bunching of the small intestine here. There are some objective measurements we can do. Um, I wouldn't call these a slam dunk, but they can help increase or decrease your concern for an obstruction. So in dogs, we'll look at a ratio comparing the maximum small intestinal diameter to the height of L5 and a ratio of less than 1.6. These guys are gonna be less likely to have an obstruction where those over two are gonna be at a higher likelihood. Similar, similarly in cats, um, a ratio, we're looking at the in small intestinal diameter to the height of the L2 cranial end plate and a ratio of less than two is gonna be a lower risk of, or lower likelihood of obstruction, or greater than three is at a higher likelihood. So this is a, an example of our case. So his small intestinal max diameter was 4.3 centimeters, and the height of L5 is 1.7, so his ratio is 2.5. So if I had seen this, I would be, at a, I would be more concerned for obstruction. Abdominal ultrasound is also something that's incredibly helpful um, when it's available. Ultrasound is going to have a greater accuracy with fewer question or questionable results. So we have a 97% accuracy with ultrasound compared to 70% with the x-rays alone. This can be limited by small intestinal gas. Um, but the picture here, we can see plication or pleating, a bunching of the small intestine. And then this material in the center is a string foreign body. If we're looking and we suspect the septic abdomen, we can do an abdominocentesis and we can look at the fluid, both uh, looking at lactate and glucose values along with looking at it under the microscope. So when we're looking at the effusion to a peripheral differential, we're looking at the values of blood compared to the effusion with lactate. If we have a difference between blood and effusion of greater than two millimoles per liter, or if we're looking at glucose and we have a difference of greater than 20 milligrams per deciliter, both of these are gonna be 100% sensitive and specific for a septic abdomen and would warrant an emergency explore. Cytology, if we're looking at this fluid under the microscope and we see intracellular bacteria, again, this is gonna be 100% sensitive and specific for a septic abdomen and we need to you know, get this guy into the OR pretty quickly. In this picture here, we can see down by letter B, there's a couple different 
uh, rod chain bacteria in here. And then uh, up in the left corner by B, again, we see more bacteria. Pathophysiology between the two are going to be a little bit different with discrete foreign bodies, about two thirds of these are going to be in the genome um, for when we're looking. And the effects of a discrete foreign body, these are going to cause impaired local perfusion within the intestine, cause bacterial translocation, tissue necrosis, and that's ultimately going to lead to intestinal perforation and septic um, peritonitis. For linear foreign bodies, locations, we'll see these commonly looped around the base of the tongue. We'll actually see this in about 50% of cats. Um, and the other place we'll see is going to be the pylorus um, portion of the stomach. And go back. so our effects, the reason the linear foreign bodies are um, particularly nasty is as the body is trying to move this through, the anchor point hold steady and the intestine bunch up and cause the whatever the linear foreign body is to become very taut and just kind of cuts right into the mesenteric border uh, of the bowel and this will lead to perforation. So our stabilization, again, fluid therapy is gonna be important. Antibiotics, if it's routine and we're not suspicious of a septic abdomen, something like cefazolin or ampicillin is appropriate. If we're worried about a septic abdomen, <clears throat> those guys will typically start on unison and patient to have broad coverage. Antiemetics, um, these guys are often very nauseous. Opioids, again, we're gonna, we're gonna stick to the full mu agonist, methadone, fentanyl, and hydro, and then supplementation. A couple of different areas we're looking at. If we're hypoglycemic from something like a septic abdomen, we want to su supplement dextrose. If we have something like hypokalemia, we want to be adding um, KCL to support these guys. Our goals for surgery, we're going to want to obviously remove the foreign body. In the cases of a linear foreign body, we may or may not cut um, the anchor point before we get in. We may wait until we're in there. There's some pros and cons um, to cutting the anchor point. The pro is we're releasing the plication. We're giving the gut a little bit of a, a rest while we're getting into surgery. The con there is that if we cut it, we may not be able to find it if it's something very, very thin. Um, once we've done with that, we want to remove any devitalized necrotic tissue, sec securely close our incision or anastomosis site. And then in the cases of sepsis, culture and established drainage. There's a number of different options we have where our, depending where our farm body is. So the gastrotomy, if we can milk a, an intestinal foreign body back to the stomach, we can perform a gastrotomy, make an incision into the stomach, uh, oftentimes having suction ready because there's usually a lot of fluid in there. So we want to have suction at the ready get out whatever foreign material is in there out, or in the cases of a linear foreign body, cut the pyloric uh, anchor point, and then we close the gastrotomy in two layers. For me, I'll use a uh, simple continuous to close the mucosa submucosa layer, and then the seromuscular layer I'll close with an inverting pattern. Uh, I use a Cushing's um, to invert the seromuscular layer. So. This bottom picture is the completed product of the gastrotomy. Gastrotomies are also nice. They're a little more forgiving. So if we can do a gastrotomy over an enterotomy, that's what I prefer to do. So our next option is an enterotomy. This is going to be performed if we can't milk our foreign body backwards uh, for whatever reason. Um, so we want to make our incision over healthy bowel. Um, and the incision should only be large enough to get our foreign body out. We don't want to have an excessively long um, enterotomy incision. So once we're out, um, we're going to go ahead and uh, close it. And I'll do this as a simple interrupted with a smaller um, size suture, something like a 3.0 or a 4.0 um, PDS. And 
in the cases of linear foreign bodies, sometimes we have to make multiple anaerotomies to fully release the linear foreign body uh, and get everything out. Um, after the, to go back, after the anaerotomy is closed, we do want to do a leak test to make sure uh, everything is secure and holding okay. Our next option is going to be a resection and anastomosis. This is going to be done with bowel that's necrotic, compromised. If we have multiple perforations, this can be done in one of two ways. Um, this slide shows um, a hand-sewn technique. The next slide will show a, a slightly different technique. But um, we're going we're gonna to first isolate our section of bowel. We're going to perform our resection. And then we can close this in a couple of different ways. This picture on the top right is closed in a simple continuous pattern. Um, something we can do, I like to use uh, simple interrupted um, when I close mine. All right, so this is a stapled resection and anastomosis. So it's a little bit different, um, a little bit more equipment's needed. So this is done with a GIA stapler. So that's what this is. It's a gastrointestinal anastomosis stapler. So what, how we use this is we perform our resection as we would. And then this picture down here kind of helps go stepwise. So we insert each leg of the GIA stapler into our segments of valve. Um, it will clamp it together on the anti-mesenteric border. The staple will fire staples across, and then there's a blade that will cut through the um, anti-mesenteric border. Um, this middle portion B, um, we see our two stapled lines. What we want to do is offset them so we don't have healing of fresh tissues back to each other. This is just going to result in reobstruction. And then this larger top portion is closed using a TA or a thrack abdominal stapler. And then this little portion at the top, we'll do uh, over sewing with uh, suture. So this top right picture is our finished product um, with the anastomosis site in the middle here. Post-operative treatments, again, continuing fluid therapy. These guys are oftentimes pretty dehydrated. Continuing pain management antibiotics as appropriate, antiemetics, prokinetics. Uh, these guys are also going to have some degree of ileus, so helping them move along is going to be beneficial. Monitoring, if we've established drainage due to a septic abdomen and we're looking at uh, fluid production from something like a Jackson Pratt drain, we can look at the fluid um, under the microscope, gauge how much production is being made, uh, also, again, looking at our uh, blood sugar, our electrolytes, and making sure everything is normalizing. Nasogastric tube placement. If we have a patient who has a lot of residual volume, we'll go ahead and place a nasogastric tube, either in surgery or um, postoperatively. This is just to help keep their stomach decompressed and aid in uh, just their comfort. To go back up to antibiotics for just a, another second, typically what we do is we'll use antibiotics for 24 hours um, post-operatively, and then we'll discontinue them as long as we had no overt spillage or contamination, or we didn't have a septic abdomen. Recently, there was a study in 2020 that came out, and they found that bacterial isolates from incisional infections following uh, GI surgery, those were often native gut flora from the dog, and these are actually resistant to the most commonly used perioperative antimicrobials we have and commonly use. <clears throat> so this is significant um, because contamination at the time of surgery is most likely gonna be the source of an incisional infection in these cases. So this is gonna justify you know, more cognizance and rigorous intraoperative hygienic protocols. And then we also do wanna have a pretty good idea of uh, antimicrobial susceptibility and these more common bacteria that we'll see. Prognosis. Again, these guys are generally going to do pretty well. Um, discrete foreign bodies are going to be a little bit uh, better. So we see a 90 to 98% survival rate in discrete foreign body cases. 
linear farm bodies, a little bit more of a range of 60 to about 98%. A lot of this has to do with whether or not we have gastric perforation and cats actually have a better prognosis compared to dogs um, with a linear foreign body. So our prognostic indicators, if we have evidence of intestinal perforation, we need multiple enterotomies, there's an extensive resection, or we have post-operative hypoalbuminemia, these are gonna be negative prognostic indicators. And then our complications, uh, incisional infections, we can see adhesion formation within the abdomen. Short bowel syndrome is something we can see if we have a massive resection, something on the order of 50 to 85 percent of the bowel. And then uh, another important complication to talk about is intest intestinal uh, dehiscence leading to secondary septic uh, peritonitis. This is typically going to occur about three to seven days postoperatively. All right, our final case is uh, Lily. Uh, Lily's a 10-year-old spade female golden. She's presenting for acute collapse, had vomited once, and her belly seemed big to the owner. On exam, her temp's 99.3, heart rate's 180, respiratory rate is 60. She has pale gums, distended abdomen with a palpable fluid wave, and a large mid-abdominal mass um, on palpation. For her diagnostics, on CBC, she was anemic. Her hematocrit was 20%. She had a stress leukogram, a mild thrombocytopenia. Her coags were, th were within normal limits on chemistry. She had an increased ALT. Her chest x-rays were normal. Um, on AFAS, she had a plus four free fluid score. And a large cavitated splenic mass was seen. Um, they took a sample of the effusion, and the PCV of that effusion was 30%. Given those findings, she is blood typed and found to be DEA negative. Uh, just a quick review for AFAS. So AFAS is an abdominal focus assessment with sonography for trauma tracking and triage. This is a brief um, ultrasound exam we'll commonly do on emergency. And what we're looking for is abdominal effusion and any obvious abnormalities. So we have our four sites. We At the bottom, we have our HR hepatorenal. DH is our diaphragmatic hepatic, SR is our splenorenal, and CC is our cystocolic. So each one of these sites, if there's fluid, counts as a plus one. And then in our picture in the bottom right here, a plus one or a plus two are going to be a small volume bleeder, so a little more minor, um, a, three, a plus three to a plus four. These are going to be a large volume bleeder and with a major bleed. So Lily's diagnosis, she has a non-traumatic hemoabdomen secondary to a splenic mass. Again, our recommendation is emergency stabilization and surgery. And dogs with spontaneous non-traumatic hemoabdomen signalman will typically see older uh, breed dogs of really any size. The ones that typically come to mind are labs, are goldens, rotties, shepherds. <laughs> And clients will typically report a range of, of signs at home. We may see lethargy and weakness, uh, decreased appetite, maybe some weight loss, collapsing episodes, and distended abdomen. On exam, these guys are typically shocky, will have pale mucous membranes. They may have abdominal pain um, or a palpable abdominal mass. Diagnostics available that we want to look at ECG. Again, we're looking for any kind of arrhythmias like VPCs, VTAC, um, coags. Typically in these cases, they're within normal, but we want to rule out any other um, cause for bleeding. CBC, we'll see various degrees of anemia, stress leukogram, uh, a mild to moderate thrombocytopenia, and this is going to be secondary to consumption. And then chemistry, we can see elevated ALTs, azotemia, and then blood type and cross-matching are gonna be important when we're talking about giving uh, blood products. Diagnostic imaging, I have a couple different uh, ways we can image these guys. As we mentioned, AFAST and TFAST is gonna be a quick 
um, cursory ultrasound to look for effusion and any obvious abnormalities. In our top right, we want to be doing three view chest x-rays every time, and we're looking for uh, you know, evidence of overt metastasis. Abdominal x-rays, we're looking for uh, obvious mass. We may see a decrease in cirrhosal detail, and then the intestines are usually being pushed away um, by the mass. Um, abdominal ultrasound, we'll use. Um, you know, we're able to evaluate the abdomen, rule out the possibility of a mass. Um, in these cases, uh, ultrasound, there's been recent studies that have shown that ultrasound is actually uh, less helpful than we thought and a little bit more limited in its utility. So in this particular study, um, they found the sensitivity. They were looking at dogs with um, splenic masses. The sensitivity for abdominal ultrasound was 87% for splenic masses, 37% for liver masses, and 31% for mesenteric masses. Um, so in that particular set of dogs, the utility of ultrasound to detect obvious um, lesions with these non-traumatic spontaneous hemoabdomens was a bit limited. Um, lastly, we have our CT scan. This is something we're kind of going to a little bit more now. Um, this is helpful because we can scan the chest and the abdomen so we can look for pulmonary metastasis. We can look for the location of the mass and any other intra-abdominal uh, metastatic lesions in the liver, the omentum, um, and the spleen. Pathophysiology of hemoabdomen uh, over in general is going to be blood loss and resulting hypovolemic shock. The most common cause we'll see is going to be cancer um, with the splenic masses being the most common. Um, so in these cases, about two thirds of our mass, splenic masses are going to be malignant. And in the presence of a hemoabdomen, that actually goes up to 75%. Um, when we're talking about hemangiosarcoma in particular, this is the most common neoplasia that we see. And that particular tumor likes to go to the liver, the omentum, and we can actually see the uh, hemangiosarcoma in the right oracle of the heart. Uh, now, the median survival time, these are important to talk about with the owner. So with surgery alone, we'll typically get a survival time of about one to three months. If we do surgery plus chemo, we're probably looking more in the area of six to nine months. So hemoabdomen in small breed dogs, similar but a little bit different. Um, so these two studies in the 2019 study, they found 50% of the small breed dogs had neoplastic splenic lesions. They were 2.6 times more likely to be malignant with hemoabdomen. And overall, 27% of the dogs had were diagnosed with hemangiosarcoma. In a more recent study in 2020, we're looking to see is there a difference between a large and small breed dog with hemangiosarcoma. And unfortunately, the prognosis is still poor um, despite being a large or a small breed dog. Stabilization, fluids. Um, talking about blood products, we have a couple different options here. So we can give whole blood at a dose of um, 20 mil per keg or packed red blood cells at 10 mil per keg. Both of these options are going to raise our PCV um, by about 10%. When do we use blood, blood products and transfuse? This can be based on the PCV um, number, but most importantly, it's based on our exam findings. Do we have obvious signs of anemia, tachycardia, tachypnea, pale gums, weakness, um, or hypotension? Um, one of the other options that it's kind of a, a last ditch effort would be auto transfusion. So we can remove blood from the abdomen, put it through a filter and give it back to the dog. There's a little bit of a risk reward here. The risk is we could be seeding the rest of the body with cancer cells. The reward is we've given blood back. Uh, moving on, antiemetics, uh, full mu opioids, lidocaine. Again, we're going to give a bolus of one to two milligrams per kilogram and then a CRI of 50 to 75 mics per kick per minute. And then aminocoproic acid is uh, a medication we'll give to help with uh, clotting ability. So this helps um, you know, these guys with clotting and, and saving what blood we, we still have in our vessels.
goals for surgery, we want to obviously remove the source of bleeding and evaluate for additional lesions. We're looking at the body wall, the omentum, and the liver. If we see anything, um, you know, we want to grab a biopsy of it. Surgical options we have here. Typically, it's a complete splenectomy, and these three pictures are probably our three most commonly used um, procedures. So this uh, left one is going to be clamping, ligating, and transecting. Um, here we like to use the ligature, which is a vessel sealing device. Uh, makes this one act to me um, pretty simple. And in the bottom here we have an LDS or ligate divide and staple device, um, which can also be used. So we want to remove the spleen, check for any residual bleeding, always send out the spleen for a biopsy to determine what's our um, underlying uh, pathology. In addition, if we're seeing anything abnormal in the liver, we do want to go ahead and get a liver biopsy. And again, this can be done in a couple different ways. This top picture here is a guillotine uh, method. Down below is a biopsy punch. Um, they, depending on what you're presented with, you, know, you can use these um, in different ways. Other you know, sampling techniques for a liver biopsy would be a <coughs> wedge biopsy, and you can actually use the ligature to get a biopsy as well. Post-operative treatment, we're going to con continue fluid therapy, blood products as needed, continue to manage pain. Antiemetics, we'll keep an eye on the ECG, and based on if we're having VPCs, we'll continue lidocaine, and then recheck um, PCVs post-operatively usually within 24 hours. Once we have you know, a patient who, whose ECG looks normal, our PCV is stable, and they're comfortable, you know, these guys are ready to go home. Prognosis, uh, it kind of depends. So in our short term, we have a good short term outcome, um, short term prognosis, because we've stopped the bleeding, which is the initial or the immediate problem. <clears throat> Long-term prognosis is going to be based on our biopsy results. So if our biopsy comes back as benign, we have an excellent long-term prognosis and we're cured. If we have something like hemangiosarcoma, splenic sarcoma, the long-term prognosis is going to be pretty poor. Uh, prognostic indicators, probably the most important one for these guys, is going to be the presence of metastatic disease. And if this is the case, their survival time is typically less than one month. Complications, we'll see incisional infections, hemorrhage, and metastatic disease commonly. <clears throat> and lastly, client communication is probably one of the most important um, parts of managing um, these particular patients. Um, we want to make sure we discuss goals, prognosis, outcome um, you know, with our owners and make sure this is what they want to do. Um, if it's something that we could be cured and we have you know another couple of years ahead of us you know we're, we we want to go for it but if it's something that could be a poor prognosis and we have to recover for two weeks out of four you know our four week survival time you know is it worth it it it'll be up to the owner all right so that's all i have uh, thank you guys for um uh, for coming and um i'll take any questions Thank you, Dr. Erickson. Awesome presentation. Now, uh, I wanted the very first question that I want to jump on uh, came from Dr. Cromwell. And normally I would just read it and then throw it to you, Dr. Erickson. Mm -hmm. But Dr. Cromwell, if you're on and listening, if you could unmute, because you need to guide us back to a particular slide. Your question was from a few slides ago. So if you can guide us back, um, then uh, we'll have you ask your question. Are you there, Dr. Cromwell? All right, well, all right, I'll uh, read the question and you tell me if you remember this slide. Uh, so the diameter of the L5 vertebrae to compare to the SI diameter, is that the narrowest width, question mark? It looks like it was the narrowest part on the demonstration radiograph you posted. I don't know how to get back to that particular screen too, is what she said. So okay. um, do you remember that slide? Yep, I can actually see if I can get back to it. Okay, um, so yeah, so we wanna go at the narrowest width of L5. 
um, to get our measurement for this ratio. So we'll go the narrowest width on the L5 vertebra and the largest, the widest uh, diameter of the intestinal loop that we're concerned about. Um, and again, based on these ratios, it'll either raise your suspicion or lower your suspicion. Um, the sensitivity and specificities for this, both of these techniques in cats and dogs is probably about 65%. So again, not a slam dunk, but definitely can help guide us. Awesome. Thank you. Of course. Uh, all right. Now, of course, it's, uh, it's Q&A time. So you've got Dr. Ergeson uh, right here in front of you. Type in your questions and uh, we'll have them answer them right now. We've got a few minutes. And uh, while you guys are typing your questions, uh, I'll fill in the silence with this. Um, so uh, at the end of September, we have a, uh, our next social networking lecture. Um, it's not two non-medical topics. So we have 30 minutes of HR and 30 minutes of, uh, we're calling it front office, but it's really it's communication um, and, and helping uh, communicate with, with tougher clients. I know that uh, we've all seen them. Um, and so uh, that is coming up towards the end um, of the month. We'll send out information on that. And then we've got cardiology next month and a few more uh, great things. If you're into surgery, we have another surgery talk that we're going to slide into the, uh, the schedule uh, in December, early December. So, um, so we're, we're pretty excited about that too. All right, follow-up question from Dr. Cromwell. I don't know if you've seen that, Dr. Erickson. Uh, dog ratio was greater than two. What was the cat ratio? The cat ratio is greater than three. Greater than three, okay. And that's going to be, the ratio is going to be the small intestine diameter to the cranial end plate of L2. Awesome. All right, here comes the next one. All right, GDV. Do you need to take the spleen uh, if, uh, apart from the stomach needs to be resected? Or is there anything difficult about resecting the greater curvature? Um, the greater curvature typically is going to be where the spleen attaches. I would say if it's right along the area of the short gastrics, then I would probably perform both a gastrectomy, a partial gastrectomy, and do a splenectomy. If it's somewhere in the body that's further away, then we can just resect the stomach and the, leave the spleen where it is. 